for many years, there have been two parts of society, the military, which tends to be very secret, and then the civilian that includes all the people that are not military. And the, the military uh, secrecy is uh, directed toward the people who support that military, which is rather incredible. I had had this initial contact with depleted uranium, and when I found they used it in war, I found, I, I found it hard to believe that they would do something like this. I mean, you're basically throwing radioactive waste at your enemy. Uh, not only did they spread it all over the um, uh, desert in southern Iraq and the northern part of Kuwait, but uh, and the Bedouin were coming in sick. And uh, they also uh, contaminated their own people. So this was the Gulf War illness. I think one of the basic mechanisms was this uh, depleted uranium. And when it came to trying to prove that it was harmless, which of course the military tried to do, they uh, took the money that Congress uh, had implemented and they gave it to uh, a firm out in California, uh, the Rand Corporation, and told them to do a search of the literature. Well, this had never been used as a weapon in war before, so there wasn't any literature. So they used the literature of uranium mining. And I'll explain in a minute the difference between uranium mining and using it in war. But uh, when you use this uranium in war, uranium, the nature of uranium is to be pyrophoric. If you had uranium here at room temperature in fine granules, it would burst into flames. Uh, it's pyrophoric. Now, when it is used in war, it hits a hardened target it's, uh, you get a pyrophoric response. You'll get a flame. It's a very hot flame, and it changed the nature of war as far as I can tell, uh, because uranium burns at 3,000 to 6,000 degrees centigrade, whereas TNT burns at 576 degrees centigrade. So there's a huge difference between those temperatures so you've got an extremely high temperature fire. It's high enough to vaporize whatever metal is in the target. It's the target that will uh, vaporize. So your uranium vapor will contain radioactive uranium, which is now ceramic. It's like firing something in a kiln. You've exposed it to extremely high temperature and it's become a ceramic. And at the same time, you're going to get a vaporization of steel, lead, nickel, aluminum, whatever is in the target. And this is released into the air as an aerosol. It's technically called a metal fume. And as it con consolidates and uh, you can breathe it in because the particles are extremely small. I would just like to say a few things about what these uh, very small particles of DU do inside of the human body. Uh, we already know that it's very easy for them to get in through the lungs because the lungs have no protection. They just have a, a barrier between the lung and the blood. Uh, and normally something that gets into the lungs has to dissolve to get through that barrier. But the nanoparticles, which are produced with the burning of uranium, uh, they're small enough to go right through into the blood. Uh, now, just to give you an idea of uh, the difference between a larger particle, larger meaning in the micron range, say, 2,000, say, two micron particle, which is small enough uh, to get to the deep part of the lung. 
it would have to dissolve to get through and into the bloodstream. But suppose instead of that two micron particle, you had 2,000 uh, one nano size particle. Now, 2,000 particles that are nano size will go right through not only into the uh, blood vessels, but they can get from the blood vessels into the cells. The larger particle would stay in the blood vessels. Uh, now, if you think of the surface area uh, and imagine this two micron particle, it has a minimum surface area for volume if it's a sphere of diameter two microns. But when you break it up into 2,000 nanoparticles, it's still the same amount of uranium. But the surface area has increased tremendously. And it's the surface area that releases the radioactive particles. So now you have 2,000 tiny particles which can release directly into the tissue their alpha particles. Uh, when you have it into the lump sum of the two micron sphere, some of those alpha particles are released inside the sphere and they can't get out. So they're, it's called self-shielding. So the particle actually shields the alpha particles that are deep inside. And it's only the alpha particles near the surface that can escape into the tissue. So what you're dealing with here, uh, even if you measure a, a two micron uh, diameter particle of uranium, it will not have the same biological effects as 2,000 nanometer size particles. Uh, so you're, you're dealing with something that can spread into any tissue or organ, including the heart, the brain, uh, the liver, or other body organs, uh, whereas the larger particle will tend to dissolve, stay in the, in the uh, arteries or veins, and uh, they'll be cleaned in the liver, and then some will be sent to be stored in the bone, and others will be sent to the kidneys for release. So uh, the smaller particles are too small to be, uh, to be filtered out by the kidney tubules, so they tend to stay in the body a long time. Now, a, a radiation dose is depending on two things. One is how strong the source is. Think about how strong the sun is. And the second thing is how long you're exposed. So that's like sitting out in the sun for an hour or sitting out for five hours. There's a difference in what happens to you. So uh, these particles that go through the body quickly and are eliminated uh, by the urine are different from the ones that can stay in the body for the rest of your life. Uh, so that it's the length of time here which adds to the severity of the dose. Now, what could they do if they get into the cells? Uh, well, one of the things that the cells do is they make all of the proteins and hormones and enzymes that we need for the body. So in the DNA, which is in the nucleus of the cell, it reproduces itself in pieces. These are what the genes do. And we have billions of genes. And these genes uh, make the protein. They say what's going to happen all down the line of the protein, what goes into it. And then they send it out of the nucleus into the more fluid part of the cell in which the nucleus rests. Now, in that fluid part of the cell, the protein will take a specific form, three-dimensional form. It might curl up and it fold in on itself and it takes a, a very beautiful and very particular three-dimensional form depending on how it's going to work in the body. And it's very important to take the right form. Now, if you have uh, heavy metals and uranium inside of the cell tissue, 
it can disrupt the form of that protein so that the protein doesn't act properly. It doesn't function. It's got all the right things in it, but if it's not shaped right, it won't fit into the place it's supposed to fit in, mm 